In this video I'm going to look at some famous art, play with an Aussie python, go into the strange world of VR, draw one of my favourite dinosaurs, and show you how I go about the whole design process. Because I'm the snake artist, and I love art and natural history. My journey begins in St. Louis, the Art Museum where I see a bronze of Lytons, an athlete wrestling a python from 1877. Lord Frederick Lytton is best known as a painter. He made some great paintings in the Romantic era, like Flaming June, The Painter's Honeymoon, The Fisherman and the Siren, Hercules Wrestling Death. It was a time of the Industrial Revolution. The Romantic movement concerned itself with human emotion. And let's not forget, it's the Romantic movement that gave us Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I enjoy art history and I like to play with it in my own art. But in this case, this is just a springboard to another idea. Because as I'm looking at this athlete wrestling with a python, it reminds me of a poster I used to have up on my wall as a teenager. And that was the King Kong poster. John Berkey was a science fiction artist that I took a lot of notice of in the 1970s. As a young teen, I would try and copy, especially the King Kong posters. I would study and try and redraw the King Kong posters in different poses. Another favourite was Orca. Again, I tried to reproduce this poster. The way I sort of learnt how to draw and paint was by copying some of the John Berkey work. He also did Star Wars, and of course he did a whole heap of science fiction novels. His artwork was a little bit unusual in that a lot of the science fiction fantasy artwork was all smooth and really slick. He had a really rough painterly look to the way he did things. And yet with this rough painterly look he just made these fantastic worlds look quite amazing. The paint strokes just gave the work a bit of life. And some of his more loose painted versions of King Kong looks a lot more action packed than some of the more overworked smooth art. So in the 1970s you had the John Berkey posters and then you had this King Kong movie. Now a lot of people hate this King Kong movie but I actually like it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm one of those very rare people that love the King Kong from the 1970s. Uh, it's the first time I saw Jeff Bridges. I thought he was great. I, I sort of see the posters advertising this and the actual monster has two different things. Uh, it's almost like they're completely unconnected. I think one of the things I was kind of disappointed about was that King Kong looked sort of more like a gorilla, whereas the John Berkey posters, they look more like oh, it's sort of Planet of the Apes. They kind of look cooler, like a more of a fantasy monster. So it's a bit odd for me that I actually prefer a fantasy monster over realism, but I don't have a real lot to do with primates, but I do have a lot to do with snakes. Just caught a tiger snake from somebody's backyard. And now I'm going to release it here in this reserve. So yeah, I loved the 1970s King Kong movie. Disappointing thing was, no dinosaurs. However, for those who know me, I do like snakes, and it did have a snake in it. Although it's a pretty freaky, goofy looking snake, nowhere near as cool as this guy. But still, snake it was. Alright, careful here, don't want to get bitten. It's extremely venomous. Pop him out. There he is. Beautiful tiger snake. And away he goes. Oh, look at that. Flatten out. Means business. I think he thinks fighting is a better option. Alright, off you go. Bye bye. I love tiger snakes, but I don't think I'm going to use tiger snakes in this work of art. 
wants to have a bit more of a tropical feel and in the King Kong movie they look more like a python. Never to be seen again. I mentioned Planet of the Apes before and I'd have to sort of say that would be my favourite 1970s um, primate sort of monsters. I loved Planet of the Apes. I just sort of thought that was the most awesome thing in the world, Planet of the Apes. I love the late 60s, early 70s ones much better than any of the modern ones. Again, they're trying to go for realism. Um, I just enjoy the fantasy. I enjoy how human they are. I enjoy the performances by the actors uh, all dressed up in that makeup. I mean, Roddy McDowell is just absolutely genius. I love the look of the gorillas. Again, they don't have the big sort of head like... I think the thing that's missing with the Planet of the Apes gorillas and the John Berkey poster gorilla is a big saginal crest. The saginal crest is this bit here. Muscles connect from that to the lower jaw here, right through the cheekbone. On mammals, reptiles, and in some dinosaurs, this indicates a strong jaw bite. Especially gorillas and especially male gorillas it signifies a very strong bite. But let's get back to Lighton's athlete struggling with a snake. Here's my rough sketch of a gorilla in the same pose. Now for the next stage in this I've got to go into a different world, the world of virtual reality. So I've put on some virtual reality gear put on the goggles using the handsets to start off with a program called Tilt Brush. It's, uh, it's kind of weird because once you get the goggles on you tend to just forget about the outside world, yet very engrossed in the world that you're in. The thing with Tilt Brush is it has lots of special effects too. It's got these you know, gassy effects, flame effects, uh, ambers, all sorts of things. Whereas I'm using this to work out the idea, uh, it's very quickly going somewhere else. I do find it tilt brush is pretty hard to work with and it feels like you're trying to draw with icing sugar or something. Or trying to draw with ribbons. And the other thing is that uh, it's hard to sort of put patterns on things. Like it's very difficult to put the patterns on this snake. So I saw this virtual camera within that takes photos and those photos, those snapshots, they end up as JPEGs. And that's something I can work with. The trouble with this tilt brush though is that I get so bedazzled by all the bells and whistles, all the special effects and all that sort of stuff that I tend to forget why I went in in the first place. So I got carried away with all those sort of dazzling effects. So I'm going to start again. I'm going to go back in. This time I'm going to have a plainer background. I'm not going to use any colours or effects. What I want to use is as much black and white as possible. So I'm pretty much making like a sculpture. As you can see in the background there, you can import a JPEG into the program and refer to it as you're working. So I've got uh, Frederick Lighton's athlete struggling with a python there but I was also thinking about John Berkey as I'm doing this. I want to see the form of this I don't really want to see all the other sort of special effects. I've also made this bigger than the last one and so I'm just concentrating on just the the ape and the python. This time when I use the camera the snapshots I'm getting something which is going to be much better as far as black and white, because I'm not going to have all the distractions. I'm going to take photographs from different angles, 
and this will help me think of you know how this might work out well as a drawing. So after all that virtual reality stuff, I've got a little printout of the last VR session I've done. I have put a couple of things together here to come up with a rough. Now what I might do next is actually ink this rough. Uh, that way sort of gives me like a practice go at inking but also gives me a feel for it so if I it's like um, ink the whole thing if I like what I see I light box it right now yeah, one of my favorite things because yeah, all this computer stuff is fun but really I just love good old-fashioned nibs dipped in ink. The next step is to lightbox the whole drawing onto another sheet of paper. I'm still playing around with a few ideas. One of the things I want to do, even though it's a little bit like a homage to the 70's King Kong movie with the big ape fighting a python, to make it look like a giant ape and a giant python, I want to sneak in a couple of dinosaurs here. And that's going to give the whole thing a, a sense of scale. So now it's time to do some referencing. And what better place to do referencing than in a museum with a big dinosaur? Texas, USA. I'm here at the Houston Museum of Natural Science in Sugarland. And I'm here to look at Ankylosaurus. This guy looks like a, a fleshy version of an army tank. So Ankylosaurus in Greek means fused lizard. And a lot of the bones and plates on this animal is fused which makes it a really tough strong little guy. I say little but some Ankylosaurus specimens have been found over 20 feet long. So this guy lived in the late Cretaceous period. It lived alongside the T-Rex. It roamed around in what's now known as the western side of USA and Canada. And like I say this guy would probably have to tangle with T-Rex. But handling T-Rex might not be that difficult. It is speculated that the club on the end of this tail is strong enough to smash the legs of a T-Rex. That combined with completely covered in his thick armour with these massive knobs, these plates, and then either side a row of spikes hanging out. It also has a couple of spikes either side of the head, protecting the eyes and again, pretty nasty guy to tangle with. There's a herbivore, and you know when you watch these movies uh, where guys get there and they come across dinosaurs, they get there and they say, it's alright, it's just a herbivore, it won't harm you. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting, you go in your imagination, you sort of think, well, would this harm you or not? You think about things like hippos and rhinos, well, that could do a lot of damage. I think this guy could do a lot of damage if it decided to get nasty with a human. Anyway, got a good sketch in, fairly good reference. I make the assumption this is a fairly accurate model, being in a museum of natural history. So I've got plenty for what I need to finish this drawing. Back in the studio I am continuing to refine and change and alter this. I decided it was too wide, I want to make it a bit more narrow. So I'm aiming at about A3 size. I've also decided to put in some text. I'm putting in the words, Ape fighting a python. I don't want to make it actually King Kong 
or Planet of the Apes. I'm just doing that as the launching point, as an idea. I want to make it my own thing, just influenced by King Kong, but not actually King Kong. More of a fantasy drawing. And I also want to give it sort of a bit of a Victorian feel. I want to make the text look like a very old label of some kind. And of course, after all that computer work, it is really nice to get back into dipping the nib into some ink and just very slowly and just methodically inking away. When I first started drawing cartoons and illustrations, I was using pens. And then somebody told me I was supposed to use nibs, so I started using nibs. And I got used to it to now, I actually really enjoy using nibs. This is one of life's pleasures. It's like carving out a big lino, it's like doing a big etching. Slowly and relaxing, just inking up this piece is just great fun. But now it comes down to some Python details. I should really cross-reference this and have a look at the Pythons. The good old Australian carpet python. Now it's called a carpet python because of the patterns that some people thought that the rough diamondy sort of shaped patterns reminded them of a carpet. It's a very beautiful python. It's fairly large, found throughout Australia and Indonesia and some parts of New Guinea. It's not found in Tasmania, a bit cold for it down there. Uh, it's not usually found in big arid zones either, but it is the most widespread of Australian pythons. The carpet python is considered semi-arboreal, so these snakes can easily climb up trees and shrubs. Yeah, he's, he's coiling. Oh, let him go. <laughs> let go of the tree. Hold that tree there. Just hold it. That's it. It doesn't feel as nice as the bush. They're also found in fairly open areas and rock faces, forest floors, often seen crossing the road. They're mostly active at night time, but also can be seen sunning themselves in the day. The average size of an adult carpet python is about two metres, which is about six and a half feet long. But they can reach up to 13 feet in length. It's quite a popular snake amongst reptile keepers, probably because of the large variation of colours and patterns. This large bodied snake in the wild can probably live up to 20 years, but in captivity even longer. The carpet python eats mostly vertebrates, frogs, lizards, birds, mammals, rodents, possums, wallabies. Since they're non-venomous, they kill their prey by constricting. They'll just wrap a coil around the rib cage of the animal squeeze in until it can't take a breath in. Smaller, younger snakes prefer to feed on lizards. Unfortunately for the carpet python, it lives alongside cane toads, which is an introduced pest, and sometimes it'll try and eat those, and they end up dead. Such a beautiful snake, and that's why I decided to use the carpet python as my model for this ape versus a python. Once I get all the ink work done, I erase the pencil lines. And now I'm colouring in bits and pieces. I'm using a combination of things to colour in with. I'm kicking off with a pencil called Ink Tense by Derwent. It's kind of like a watercolour pencil. You just draw in the bits that you want a bit of colour, then you add a bit of water. But I'm also using watercolour as well. It's just a fun medium to play with. It's a little bit unpredictable. 
And I'm doing a strange combo of colours here, which I'll probably have to knock back a bit. I wanted to do the words ape, fighting and python in a, a sandy colour and a purple and a green because they're the colours of the Planet of the Apes hierarchy. But um, the apes just doesn't stand out. I wanted to have a, like a Dr. Zayas sort of orangey orangutan colour. But it's not working out. I have to make that brighter. I've got the purple, which is uh, what the gorillas on the original Planet of the Apes wore. And of course the green for the chimpanzees. But all these are a little bit too bright. I have to knock them back a bit. So I do like to leave little clues to pop culture in some of my art without actually using the pop culture reference. And to use plenty of yellow ochre and raw sienna through this gives it sort of a bit of a sepia look. Again, trying to make it look like it's something from Victorian times. Even though King Kong itself is very much a 20th century creation, it sort of does have this classic feel to it. The fact that it was filmed in black and white to start with, and it was around about that time you had a lot of Tarzan films and a lot of uh, and a lot of films made from classic books like Treasure Island. And so it was and so King Kong arose in that time. And so to make it look like it actually came from Victorian times, I think it's a lot of fun just to play with the whole idea of that. And also you've got Frederick Lighton, who's from the 19th century. You also think about things like Dracula, Frankenstein, all that kind of cool stuff all happened at that time. And I've quite often, in my mind, probably because of the universal monsters like the werewolf and Frankenstein, Dracula, in the early part of the 20th century, I've often lumped in King Kong with that group. And so since Dracula and Frankenstein were from that 19th century. It's fun to try and lump in King Kong, uh, giving it that, that false heritage. It's almost like I'm trying to make like a classic monster even more classic. Like I say, it's not actually King Kong, but I'm aiming for that feel of King Kong and the feel of Planet of the Apes. So here's my finished piece. As you see, I went through quite a lot of, of design process to get this one done. Um, first, there was the inspiration of uh, both Light and, and Berkey, which I wrote down here. Usually, when you're inspired by another artist, you write the word after and the artist's last name. So it's after Light and after Berkey. So yeah, I went through a lot of design process. There was the inspiration. There was the gathering of reference, the sketching of pythons, the sketching of dinosaurs. There was the looking at the pop culture ape. Um, why did I go to so much effort? It was probably because it's fantasy art. I've had the experience, probably because of my age, that when I went to art school, uh, any ideas of becoming a fantasy artist was pretty much crushed and I was made to do abstract art and conceptual art. Now, the result is I actually quite like a lot of abstract art. I love a lot of the conceptual art, but I still love this better. And so it's almost an insecurity of mine that if I do fantasy, I have to put all, as much as I can into it to make it try and work. As far as this goes, composition. I went for a bit of a, a S shape going through there. When you have a diagonal, it creates a drama um, in any sort of composition. When you've got so many colors going on, it also has got lots of stuff in it, lots of colors, and so that's why it has to be um, really worked on quite hard. I'm fairly happy with the end result, and I quite like the idea that I'm doing something I want to do. It's, this is not a job for you know, it's not a commission job, it's not a fine art job, it's something I wanted to do just for fun, it's only for fun. So whereas normally the design process would be 
uh, probably rough thumbnail sketches, uh, working from reference and then refine and refine that. You sort of saw that kind of happen here, but instead of the rough thumbnail sketches, we used virtual reality. And using the virtual reality just to take photographs of this from all angles, I ended up with this. And I think I was probably impressed with the diagonal, which I wanted to get into the composition. I wanted to make that strong, and I think that is probably the strongest part, as you see this diagonal coming through there. So it works on that sort of level, that it's you know, high drama. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this, and I'll be putting this up on Redbubble, so if anybody wants prints or posters of this uh, thing here, might even get like, you know, books, journals, notebooks, it's a few different types, you know, t-shirts, it's a few different products you can get based on this if you really like it, um, drop in the link below in the description, otherwise I hope you just enjoyed the whole process of watching it happen, I sort of did. I'll catch you next time. You're still here. You got this far into the video. I'm about to roll up the credits. Well, as a special treat for you guys who are really hardcore and you're still here, I'm going to show you what somebody who was obsessed with Planet of the Apes back in the 1970s. I haven't done this since the 70s. This is what I used to do with a newspaper and a ballpoint pen.